Good morning. Welcome. Rainy day. Your hair doesn't show it at all. Thank you. Uh, stand with me and we'll read scripture. Happy Mother's Day to one and all. Psalm 36, starting in verse 5. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like a mighty mountain. Your justice is like the great deep. O Lord, you preserve both man and beast. How priceless is your unfailing love. Both high and low among men find refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Continue your love to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart. If you have a bulletin this morning, you can follow along. If you're a creature of habit, uh, this may be a little unsettling for you today. Um, the bell won't ring at exactly the same moment, so follow along. Uh, after I finish, we'll have one song, and then uh, Jaden Flores is going to come and give our first Mother's Day message. Okay, let's do that. That's why it's written down. We'll do a song, then we'll do communion, then we'll do a song, and then Jaden, and then we'll do a song, and then Ruth Ann, then we'll do a song, and then Gwendolyn. So you know what's coming. All right. So on Wednesday nights, we do something with the kids. This is going to be a little bit of a challenge, but we're going to pray together this morning. So I'm going to say it. And then together, you're going to repeat it. That's the way we practice on getting the kids to pray out loud. So I'll try to chop it up in pieces you can get, and uh, we'll do this together. Repeat after me. Dear God, today I thank you for my mom. I thank you that through my mom, you gave me life. I thank you that through my mom, you gave me strength. I thank you that through my mom, you gave me faith. I thank you that through my mom, you gave me guidance. Dear God, Please bless each mom with faith, with strength, with encouragement, and with wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing. Very fitting prayer. Thank you, Tim. Our first song, Love Lifted Me. If you've ever fell down as a child, it was love that lifted you. <laughs> Ever his praise and sing, 
love the mighty and the true. Merits my soul for song. Faithful, loving service to do him belong. Love lifted me, love lifted me. With nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Stern from danger, look upon the Jesus completely safe. He will lift you by his love out of the angry wave. He is the master of the sea. Billows his will obey. Be your savior, wants to be saved today. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Take a seat. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. If you are a visitor today and a baptized believer in our Lord Jesus Christ, we invite you to share in this communion time with us. Wash your hands. When you were little and getting ready to take your seat at the family dinner table, did your mom ever ask you, have you washed your hands? If you had, you probably proudly held them up to show her. Well, on some of those rare occasions when she caught you dirty-handed, you probably sheepishly slipped away to put soap and water to work. As often as we were reminded, we should have remembered to wash our hands every time. But since we are creatures of forgetfulness, or just too preoccupied with other things, that getting ready for the table often got lost in the shuffle. Then, too, there were times we knew our hands were dirty, but we came to the table anyway. Some in the early church developed a bad habit of coming to the table, the communion table, without clean hands. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church of Corinth, said, a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight. It's important to point out that Paul was not demanding perfection, but calling for preparation. Some of these early believers were coming to the table with indifference or even arrogance. What was supposed to be a reverent, and holy gathering was being tainted by hands and hearts unready to handle anything holy. What about our hands? How are we coming to the table? With a life that's gone unexamined, Paul told the Corinthians that coming with dirty hands invited judgment, not just the stern word of a mother, but of a God whose judgment is a far worse serious reckoning. The communion table is all about our being forgiven by God. So Paul is not saying all the cleaning up is the product of our own labor. God is the one who makes it possible for us to have clean hands and hearts. But if we treat the sacrifice of Christ with indifference, if we fail to live lives that honor what 
the, what the cleansing brings, we soil the hands that he died to make clean. So an important question needs to be asked before we eat the bread and drink from the cup today. How clean are our hands? It can be a deadly thing to come to God with unexamined lives. If we forget forgotten that all-important truth, we might want to take a prayer for a moment before we all sit down to eat and wash our hands. And when the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Shall we pray? Dearest Father in heaven, we thank you and count it a privilege to be in your house this morning. We especially, Father, thank you for this time that can be set aside to think of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and of his sacrifice here on earth. He that knew no sin took our sins upon him at the cross of Calvary so that we might have forgiveness so that you might offer us salvation to live with you in heaven. More importantly, we thank you, Father, for Jesus' resurrection, that through it we can have victory over sin and victory over Satan. Now, Father, as we take of this loaf and of this cup, help us to, help us to do so in a worthy manner. Help us to examine our lives and ask forgiveness once again, for our sins. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.
Count your blessings. All righty. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jaden Flores. I am beyond honored to um, have been asked to come up here and talk to you guys today, and I'm very thankful that you guys are going to listen to me ramble on. Um, when Tim asked me, I was, of course, yes, I'll do it. Um, I've, wanting, I've been wanting to do something like this for a while. I just never knew how to get into it, I guess you could say. So I am beyond thankful to have Tim in my life to help me um, pursue this kind of passion or dream that I have. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I uh, talk a lot. Um, my family, Eli, Tim, Miss Beeson, they all know that I talk a lot. And um, when it comes to my faith and my family, I um, enjoy it a lot. So thank you. Um, I wanted to start off by reading Psalms 139, verses 13 through 14. Uh, it reads, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. Oh, how well I know it. Um, there were two reasons why I picked this. My first reason was because it gives glory to God. And we all know that without God, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be able to have this great church family. I wouldn't be up here talking to you guys. We wouldn't have the friendships and the mothers in our lives like we do. 
And reason two is because it shows that God works through people. Um, God doesn't care who you are. He doesn't care what your age is. He doesn't care what race you are. He doesn't care what your family background was, what your gender is. He, he works through anybody. He works through everybody to help us and guide people. So because it's Mother's Day and because the passage talks about our mother, I obviously am going to be talking about moms. Um, the definition of a mother is not the person who has given birth to you, but the Bible says a mother is a woman who loves her child throughout the entire life. In spite of her role in their life, or it might change, her love and care remains the same. I personally am very, very thankful for my mother and my grandmother because they are the mother figures in my life. And I will never be able to express that enough. Um, I'm sure we can all think of at least one person in our personal lives or in this church community and family that fills that role. And we need to remember to give thanks to them because I'm sure we, we do not say it enough. Um, the, I wanted to end with um, another verse, um, Proverbs 31, 31. And it says, honor her for all that her hands have done. Like I said, being a mom, it doesn't mean carrying a child and giving birth to it. It means um, loving them for the, their entire life. So it's more than just a, um, it's a big commitment and it's a big thing. And for all of the mothers out there, I am so honored to be talking to you guys today. And I, I hope that one day that I get the same opportunity to love somebody as much as I know you guys love your children. Um, we all need to remember to thank God for putting such amazing mothers in our life, especially in this church. They, I know that I don't thank God enough for the wonderful mother figures in my life, so um, I feel like we all need to continue to thank God for them. Thank you, guys. I'm sure there's at least one proud mama back there. <laughs> that was very good. Let's uh, sing Rock of Ages.
When Tim first asked if I would present my favorite Bible mom to the congregation on Mother's Day, I was hesitant because there are so many great Bible mothers. I pondered long and hard, considering such moms as Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, Sarah, the mother of Isaac, even Jesus' mother, Mary. But I kept returning to Jochebed, my ultimate favorite, and I'd like to share her story. Like me, bah. what did I do? <laughs> like me, I'm sure all of you grew up with wonderful Sunday school stories about Daniel in the lion's den, Jonah in the whale, Noah in the ark, Moses in the bulrushes, as well as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. These stories were filled with excitement and did an excellent job of teaching young children about the awesome power of God. <clears throat> but as I grew up, I began to realize that none of these stories included women, except for Moses. I often wondered about the mothers of these great men of the Bible, but it wasn't until I became a mother myself that I became curious enough to do some deeper digging into the story of Moses and his mother. In the book of Exodus, I learned that Moses was born in a time when the Israelite population was increasing and the Egyptian pharaoh felt threatened by their numbers. Fearing that these enslaved people would join forces with his enemies and take over the nation, the pharaoh in, had ordered all newborn Hebrew boys to be thrown into the Nile and drowned. Imagine my frustration as I read Exodus 2 that records the story of how Moses' mother hid him for three months and then placed him in a basket coated with tar and pitch and set it along the bank of the Nile hoping to save the baby's life. But I didn't even know her name. My frustration increased as I continued to read Exodus. I even learned the names of the midwives, those God-fearing women who disobeyed the Pharaoh's orders and let at least some of the boys live. But it wasn't until Exodus 20 that Jochebed is introduced as the wife of Amram and the mother of Aaron and Moses. I continued to be puzzled because Jochebed's daughter Miriam, her firstborn child, and the one who assisted her in saving Moses, was not named until Numbers 26, and only then when listing the Levite clans. My quest to learn the name of Jochebed did not begin as a search for the important role God had set for the women of the Bible, although it did include that. But as a young mother, I wanted to see how my maternal feelings compared with this strong woman's now that I had finally learned her name. I've always admired strong women who use their God-given intelligence to solve problems and attain lofty goals, and I considered Jochebed one of those women. I can only imagine the anguish she felt as she gave birth to her, child, her third child, knowing that if it was a baby boy, he would be thrown into the crocodile-infested Nile before she even had a chance to cuddle and nurse him. Jochebed, however, was a godly woman who was blessed with a godly midwife, and her baby boy was saved. For three months, Jochebed hid her baby, <clears throat> as she had devised a plan that she prayed would allow Moses to grow up. There's no mention that she consulted with her husband, but we know God's hand guided Jochebed's scheme because he had great plans for her baby son. She knew when the Pharaoh's daughter usually came to the Nile to bathe. So Jochebed placed her three-month-old son in a waterproof basket and left him near the area where the young girl would be, hoping that the princess would adopt him and raise him in the Pharaoh's palace. Her young daughter Miriam hid close by, and when the Pharaoh's daughter took the crying baby from the basket, Miriam ran to her and asked if she would like one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby. No doubt, Jochebed prayed hard as she waited for Miriam to bring her the news. Would the Egyptian princess have pity on this abandoned child, or would she be as hard-hearted as her father and throw this little baby into the Nile? Only a mother's love, the intelligence God had provided her, and the desire to save the son she already knew would be special could have given Jochebed the courage to take such a chance. Not only did the princess save the baby, 
but she paid Jochebed to nurse Moses until he was weaned. What a blessing. What a risk this young mother took to trust her infant son to the kindness of an idolater whose own father might demand his death. We're not told how long Jochebed lived after Moses was weaned or how much contact she had with her child as he grew. But the love of God she exemplified, I'm sorry, but the life she, life she lived, the courage she showed in saving her son, and the love of God she exemplified were the chief influences that prepared Moses to accomplish the great task of leading his people out of Egyptian bondage. The fact that Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter shows us the bond he formed with his birth mother in such a short while. Years ago, as I looked into the eyes of my own newborn babies, I was reminded of the incredible suffering this Bible mother endured as she gave birth to her baby boy, knowing that Pharaoh's orders could keep her from ever seeing or even holding him in her arms. I knew that my own faith could not compare to that of, jo of Jochebed's, but I knew that if confronted with a similar situation, like Jochebed, I would do all in my power to love, nurture, and protect my babies, and would pray that I too would find God's favor in doing so. This year for Valentine's Day, my grandson gave me a mug that says, the influence of a great teacher can never be erased. And I'd like to reword that as I think of Jochebed. As we see in her story, the influence of this incredibly strong, praying mother continued to live through her godly children long after she was gone. Yes, Jochebed is my favorite Bible mom, and I pray that the example of her faith, love, and courage has also inspired other young mothers as it did me so many years ago. Thank you, Ruth Ann. Because he lives.
the light of glory and I'll know who he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know Gwendolyn Whitefield has our third and final Mother's Day message for this week. Gwendolyn. When Tim asked, sent me a message and asked if I would talk about my favorite mom from the Bible, I thought, favorite? Really? I had never thought about of having a favorite mother in the Bible. But at the same time, Naomi from the book of Ruth came to mind. I feel that so many times that when we study the book, book of Ruth, um, the main focus is all about Ruth. And we overlook Naomi as just a trivial secondary character. Let me share you a brief review of Naomi's life. Naomi and her husband Elimelech and their two sons lived in Bethlehem. I'm sure life was good, having family and friends close by for support and fellowship but then the crops failed in Judah. That's when Elimelech moved his family to the country of Moab. I'm sure this caused mixed emotions for Naomi. She was leaving her home, her family, friends, to move to a country that didn't have a very good relationship with hers. And they did not worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Would they be accepted? or treated as outsiders that had no place there at all. But it was a place where there was food that could be grown to care for their family, so they went. While they were there, Elimelech died, leaving her with her two sons. Scripture doesn't tell us how old the boys were, but in Hebrew families, moms would teach her children about God and everything they needed to know about life until the age of 12. Then the father would take over the education of his son, teaching him a trade and how to live as a man of God. So as a single mom, she was responsible for teaching them in their early years. And now she was having to make sure they could apprentice with a local man who would teach them a trade. But still, she was blessed to have sons that would be able to care for her into her old age. The Bible tells us that her sons married local girls, Orpha and Ruth. Even though they were not of the Hebrew faith, I have a feeling that Naomi was happy at the prospect of having grandchildren and the continuation of the family line. But sometimes our hopes and dreams don't turn out the way we plan. The Bible tells us that they lived there for about 10 years when both of her sons died, leaving her and her two daughters-in-law alone with no male relative to take them in. This had to be a very difficult time for them. Now, when Naomi heard that the Lord had given his people a good harvest, she and her two daughter-in-laws got ready to leave Moab and go to Judah. Again, I think she may have had mixed emotions. Sad to be leaving her new friends and the life they had established there. But then again, Naomi must have been excited to be going home, to be with family and friends that she had not seen for so many years. To be home again. While they were on their way, Naomi stops and tells her daughter-in-laws that they should go back to their families and find another husband. After telling them all the reasons they should go home, Orpah finally gives in, and after crying together, 
she kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth, she held on to Naomi and would not let go. Naomi tried one more time to convince Ruth she should go with Orpah and ask her, why don't you go with her? Then Ruth delivers probably the best known part of the book of Ruth. Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where, where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Wow. What a testament to Naomi's faith and character. Up until now, there hadn't been anything really remarkable about Naomi. She was living life as so many women of her day, raising her children, cooking, washing, all the things that were needed to keep a household going. But we see the impact of Naomi's life and testimony, that the, the, the impact that it had on her daughter-in-law. Ruth was giving up everything she had ever known to follow this woman to a foreign land and put her faith in God. Naomi had lost sons, but here she truly gained a daughter. So on they traveled. I looked it up, and it's 50 miles from Moab to Bethlehem. And it's not a smooth road between the two locations. This was through steep, rocky, mountainous country. Two women traveling alone in this harsh environment. Walking all day, sleeping by the side of the road at night, and God saw them through safely. Upon arrival in Bethlehem, Naomi was greeted by the people of the town who were excited to see her. But here, after a roller coaster life and a grueling trip home, she was exhausted, drained, and feeling sorry for herself telling the women to call her Mara, which means bitter, because she said, the Lord has dealt very bitterly with me. She was having a pity party. I'm sure we can all relate to, to that on some level. Thankfully, she did not stay there, because later we see Naomi giving godly guidance and encouragement to Ruth, resulting in Ruth marrying Boaz, who was a descendant of Elimelech. And together they were the parents of Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who was the father of King David, and so on in the lineage to Jesus Christ. You, you may be thinking, but yeah, but she's still an ordinary woman. Yes, she was. With one remarkable difference, she put her faith in God. Some of the things that I find that make Naomi an outstanding woman are, first, she was a woman of faith. Not the showy, look at me kind of faith, or my God's better than your God's, but a quiet, deep-rooted relationship with God that was exhibited in her daily life. Ruth was definitely impacted by her life, her life of faith. And yes, she did have a pity party when she got home, but I find that noteworthy. She could have come home, put on a happy face, and said, everything's wonderful. Anybody relate here? I do. Instead, she was brutally honest about her feelings. She had some devastating events in her life that were weighing heavily on her when she got home. We've all had times when we're feeling down about everything around us, but God is faithful, and Naomi didn't stay bitter. Also, Naomi, Naomi was in the right place at the right time. She had no idea what her life would be like in Moab, but she made the best of it. 
She was blessed to have daughter-in-laws who loved and cared for her sons and loved her. Another right place she was in was in going back to Bethlehem, where Ruth would marry Boaz. With either impending move, she could have said, why bother? We could just make do where we are. And finally, like Naomi, we have grief and happiness, times of want and times of plenty, trials and blessings, times of depression and times of rejoicing. So regardless of our circumstances, Naomi teaches us that if we are in the right place, doing the right thing for the right reason and keeping our faith in God, he is always with us. Can we stand while we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this church family and the, the godly women that are here as mentors to other women and also act as a mother role to many of our, our gentlemen and, and men who just need a, a person that they can count on reliable and good advice. I thank you that um, we have godly mothers in our past that through their faith and their commitment to making sure that we came to church with them and that we learned everything we could about God and the Bible and establishing a relationship with your, with your son that is so vitally important in our lives today. And I pray as we go on uh, that we as mothers and fathers and men and women, that we too will keep the things that our mothers taught us in our hearts, that we too will be a godly example as our mothers were to us. In these things I pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you today for our earthly moms, for the blessings that they have been to us, giving us life and strength, guidance and uh, faith. And so, Lord, we ask today that they might know that your grace is enough, that your strength is enough. We are thankful for the testimonies we have heard today, for the witness that we have heard today, that God, you are good. And it's in your Son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.